right, we're getting a late start, but we can still go on ahead. Um, last uh, last couple days, I was in Dallas, Texas. Um, I had a uh, an event my graduate school was putting on. They call it the Sermon Symposium, where they have um, guest lecturers and uh, kind of just presentations on how to do ministry better. And also they ask the graduate students to come along and present certain topics, to present a paper, you know, like you would in a graduate school. And they asked me to come and present a topic, and I said, sure, that's fine. I don't mind at all. And I went, um, flew out Wednesday, spent an extra day with my family. Thursday, got back into Dallas, and um, Thursday night we started the event. Friday, I presented my paper, and I'll, if you want it, you can have it, just... It's an academic paper, so it's not going to be the most interesting thing, but I think I was able to pick a topic that was actually pretty interesting. And I've kind of talked about it recently, but while I'm filling in for this one week, I'll start talking about it just a little bit more. Um, You know, the first line of my paper is, what do Luke Skywalker and Moses have in common, right? Right? And, and uh, it's funny because, you know, this is, a, this is an academic event, and so they really didn't see that coming at all. And I dove into just this basic theory that all stories, all mythologies, all religious stories, all legends, there tends to be this very common story of a hero who goes into the unknown, who, has com- who combats evil forces, who wins in the end, he has to grow and be transformed, and then he returns home. Very common kind of uh, story. And you see that in modern film all the time. And the example I used today was Luke Skywalker, right? Um, And then I took this concept, this very common type of story, and I asked, how does it measure up to the Bible? Do we see this in the Bible, right? And what I'm kind of doing is I'm kind of comparing human-made stories with God's stories, right? And, and part of what I was trying to present, I was trying to present it as a different way to study your Bible. Not like brand new reinventing the wheel, but in a way of where we're trying to dig into who these characters are. It's a method of biographical study. And, you know, and I made the point that In Exodus chapter 3, you have Moses being all timid, but as you're reading, and you keep reading, and you're getting through all these chapters, by the time you get to Exodus chapter 16 or 15, you might have forgotten what happened in Exodus chapter 3. That's one of the downsides to having chapter numbers. You know, and one of the downsides of us approaching the Bible in a different way than we would approach most any other book. You know, and there are good things about it, because the Bible is not just another book. But if you were to, you know, in your English literature classes, you know what I mean? Whenever you had to sit down and you had to read a book, and then you maybe you had a test over it, and maybe the questions would be like, uh, what sort of changes did you see in the main character from beginning to end? Or in this moment, in this scene, in the novel, um, what, what is the source of tension? Right? And it's those kind of questions that sometimes we don't always ask whenever we come to the Bible. Because whenever you start taking those like English literature questions and you start looking at the Bible, you're going to notice things that you wouldn't have noticed otherwise. And that's why I'm, I wanted to study this. It is our way of learning more and digging deeper into the Bible. And, and so I just use Moses as a for instance, and I'm just going to kind of walk through this and kind of we'll get into the text in just a second, right? And so I kind of went over, where did this theory come from? Or there's this guy, Joseph Campbell, he studied a lot of mythology, he came to this idea. But really what we're trying to do is when we're looking at a Bible character, we're asking, how are they growing, Right? We're not looking at, like, whenever you have Moses at the burning bush, God says, I want you to deliver my people. And Moses says, I'm not qualified, not me. He says, 
who, what would I say? He says, they won't listen to me. He says, please send someone else, right? And, you, and there's a lot of lessons in that chapter. But there's also a lot of lessons when you take that and compare it to other events in Moses' life, right? In that kind of event, you see Moses being so timid, hesitant. You could fast forward to like chapter 5. And in chapter 5, uh, Moses actually went to Pharaoh for the first time, and he said to Pharaoh, hey, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, no, if you guys need, ha- want such extra time, we're going to make it harder for you. We're not going to give you straw for your bricks. And so he made it even harder on the Israelites. The Israelites get upset. They say, Moses, why did you do that? Moses goes to God and say, God, why did you do that? You see something very similar in that he's doubtful, right? He, 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 he thinks, oh, I failed. Everything's for nothing. I only made things worse. And you, you get a sense of who Moses is as a character. And then if you were to fast forward, I think one of the biggest moments in this whole, in the Exodus, book of Exodus for Moses, was at the Red Sea. Whenever they had escaped Egypt, behind them was the Egyptian army chasing them. In front of them was the Red Sea. Right? Right? And you have one of those moments where it looks like they're hopeless. And it looks like they, you only made things worse, right? And the Israelites are looking at Moses and saying, Moses, why should you bring us out here just to die? It's a very similar, a very similar event to what happened in chapter 5. Whenever, Pharaoh, whenever Moses went to Pharaoh and only made things worse. He's like, okay, we got out of Egypt, but now they're just going to kill us. And they're going to make things worse. In chapter 3. In chapter 5, Moses heard the Israelites' complaints, and he went to God and complained with doubt. At the Red Sea, I can't remember exactly the chapter, I think it's somewhere around 14 or 13. Egypt's chasing them. The Israelites complained to Moses. Instead of Moses complaining to God, Moses does something very different. Moses looks at the Israelites and he says, God's going to take care of this. Just be still, be quiet, and wait. Moses goes to God and says, God, what would you like us to do? He kind of looks at God and says, God, how are you going to get me out of this one? That's a big change, isn't it? From Moses hearing the Israelites' complaints and then complaining to God, to Moses hearing Israelites' complaints and instead calming them and looking to God not for, to complain, but for direction. And it's things like that that sometimes we miss. But whenever you would read the, the, the events of Moses, not just kind of with an agenda of trying to get to understand who Moses is, you're going to notice he grows. There is so much growth in the person of Moses. But there's also, he also makes plenty of mistakes. I mean, there is one point where he does, where he, after the Red Sea, he looks to God and says, God, they're about ready to stone me. There's that moment where he is just so irritated with the Israelites when God told him to speak to the stone and he hit the stone instead and God punished him for it. I mean, Moses, it's not a perfect trajectory. And so you see a lot of humanity in this. And it's comforting to see these things because that's how we are. You know, you see Moses' starting point where he had lots of room to grow. And then you see him growing and you learn it's possible. And then maybe you see him backslide every now and then. And you're like, oh, I know how that is falling back into those old habits. And so what we're really kind of looking at when we talk about heroes, we're looking at someone who is praiseworthy, someone worthy of honor. Someone that you should be, you should look to for an example, right? And if God, and I think God has His own definition of hero, what a hero is, right? And our definition as humans for hero is way different. And so when you come at this, and you're kind of like in your mind, you're thinking, okay, this is like a grand novel, or in your mind, this is like a film, like a like a Star Wars. You're going to see big differences and similarities. And you start asking, okay, 
in your typical movie, what would you see? And how is Moses different? And there are plenty of differences. One of the biggest one is when all that happens, you know how old Moses is? Whenever he delivered the Israelites, how old is Moses? 80. Luke Skywalker was not 80. Right? I mean, when's the last time you saw a heroic drama where the hero saves everyone and the main character's 80? I'm not sure I've ever seen a movie kind of like that. You know? And so it, it, it's we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to appreciate God being the best storyteller. We're trying to appreciate that God knows how to tell stories and he tells them better, right? And we're, we're, we're kind of trying to reevaluate our own way of, uh, our own idea of what a hero is as you kind of look through the life of Moses. And so this is just kind of the theory. There's this cycle where the, the hero goes out into the unknown. He leaves his home to the unknown. He experiences different people, different trials. He's victorious in the end. He wins something, and then he comes back home to benefit everyone else because of what he won. And just so you know, Jesus fits all of that perfectly, right? Um, and so I kind of just kind of went through, oh, here's the story of Star Wars. Here's the story of Luke Skywalker, just trying to get it into their mind. How Luke Skywalker left his home, right? He learned the Force, this power. He... Um, he faced enemies. He had to grow. There are so many occasions where he comes in contact with danger, but he's victorious. He saves the princess. He defeats the Death Star, and he wins in the end, right? And then you come to Bible characters, and you start asking, okay, how are our Bible characters similar? And you kind of start thinking about these, these common tropes you might see in film. There is a big one in Destiny, Right? What is destiny? Well, destiny is whenever things are faded, whenever something beyond, when something happens, but it was supposed to happen. Right? And destiny is a big theme in films and movies, Matrix, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, uh, a lot of novels, a lot of ancient religions. What they call destiny, what do we call? We call providence. We say it's God's will. And when you look at the life of Moses, there's a lot of providence, especially in the first two chapters. Pharaoh wants to kill all the Hebrew children. The Hebrew midwives say no. Pharaoh says, throw all of the children, all the boys into the river. Moses' mother says no. Moses' sister watches. The Egyptian princess finds him. All of that is just so coincidental. Is it coincidental? No. It's God's will, God's providence. And as you read through the Bible in the Old Testament, you're going to see all of these coincidences. And, you know, I, I love the quote, coincidences are when God remains anonymous. That all of these things just so happen to fall into place. That's God. You look back at your own life, maybe you've seen some coincidences. Maybe there have been times in your life where you think, maybe that was God. Whereas a person, non-religious, might say, that was destiny. That was fate. They might say, um, all of life is a simulation. Right? That, that's a popular one right now. But you see these heroes and... One of the biggest differences about heroes out in films and movies and, and novels and legends, one of the biggest differences between their heroes and the Bible's heroes is that the heroic character doesn't come from themselves, right? Like, like in Star Wars, Luke Skywalker, it's all about whether Luke Skywalker is going to win in the end. It's all about Luke Skywalker being good, being better, training. In the story of Moses, did Moses accomplish his task by his own strength? Not at all. See, the heroes in the Bible, what makes them heroic is that they serve God. 
in that when it, co- when it came to getting the Israelites out of Egypt, Moses was very important, and Moses played a big part, don't get me wrong, but none of it would have been possible if it wasn't for God. That at the end of the day, Moses' life, the main character of his stories, was God. And that all these people in the Old Testament that we look up to, right? Moses, David, Abraham, Peter, Paul, all these different people, they're heroes because of how obedient they were to God. And that is very different to what you'd see on the big screen. You see other things like, you know, a lot of the times a hero will have an origin story, and Moses has his own hero, his heroic origin story. You have these archetypes. There are typical types of characters that a lot of times you'll find. And like with Moses, he has his own villain. That's Pharaoh. And one of the interesting things about the Exodus narrative is that, you know, you start reading and you start seeing Moses grow, and then whenever you hit the plagues, there's a shift in focus. We're no longer are we just focused on Moses. We're now focused a lot on the villain. Exodus focuses a lot on Pharaoh. And as you see kind of Moses increase, Pharaoh starts to decline. And that Pharaoh continues to be just stubborn. And the more the greater the stakes get, the more stubborn he is, and the more stubborn he is, and the more he refuses. And then sometimes he'll break and he'll say, okay, fine, just kidding. Right? And so Pharaoh and Moses are just this, uh, this duality. Pharaoh is the shadow of Moses. Pharaoh is everything that Moses is not. And as Moses becomes more, Pharaoh becomes less. To the point that the Egyptian officials said, do we have to do what you're saying? Let's just do, let's just listen to Moses. We're having all these plagues. I mean, that's, that's a shift in power. Right? And that's really common to see in narratives and novels and films where eventually Pharaoh says, fine, you can go. And then he says, but also bless me. That is a shift in power there. Olivia, I think I saw your hand. I was just going to say that it's a representation of the shift in power, but also the representation of God's influence on the nation. They had strayed away, and then as Moses' influence had taken over in their mentality and their desire for freedom, they were relying more on God, and Pharaoh couldn't control them in that way. Yep, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, Pharaoh was losing control of the people with that shift in power, absolutely. And, and so whenever you kind of look at Pharaoh, he's kind of, he, he's the villain, right? He's the enemy, and there's almost this battle of wills between Pharaoh and Moses, right? Uh, you know, I counted, they, they met at least 16 times, maybe 15 times, where Moses came to Pharaoh, and then Pharaoh said no, and then Moses went and did a plague. Pharaoh called him back, and he said, can you get rid of this plague? And Moses said yes, and then repeat, and then repeat, and repeat, and repeat, and repeat, right? And, and they, so they met around 15, 16 times. They might have met more, but that's what I counted in the Bible. There's this test of will between Moses and Pharaoh, and Like I said at the beginning, whenever Moses was called, he was so timid, so hesitant. He said, not me, Lord. I'm not qualified. I can't do this. At the first hint of defeat, Moses went to God and complained and says, why did you do this? Why why didn't you finally free them? And yet Moses, he starts going to Pharaoh. And what instead you see now, which is growth, consistency, courage. Moses going to Pharaoh and saying to Pharaoh, do this. Pharaoh is the most powerful guy in the world right now. I mean, this is, he's bossing around the king. He's, I mean, he's doing it in a very gentle and humble way, but Pharaoh, with his huge ego, any sort of request made to Pharaoh is a challenge to his authority in his perception. And Pharaoh and Moses knows that, and he's doing it anyway. And it doesn't matter how angry Pharaoh gets, Moses still keeps coming to Pharaoh and saying, let my people go. I mean, and there, and there was even one point where Moses looked at Pharaoh and said, Pharaoh, I'm not going to come to you again. This is your last chance. That is not Moses that we see in chapter 3 or chapter 5, right? 
And part of the reason I'm putting all this together in this presentation and, and, and kind of doing the study is because you wouldn't notice that if you just go chapter by chapter through Exodus. We have this, th this tendency. You know how when you walk into a room, you forget why you walked into a room? We do that with the Bible. We flip the page and we forget what came before it. And again, I think it's because we have these chapter numbers, and I'm not against the chapter numbers, but I have a Bible in my office that has no verse numbers and no chapter numbers, and I've never seen the Bible so differently when I read it that way. When you flip the page, remember what came before it. And that's kind of almost like what my sermon's going to be on this morning. We're going to talk about Abraham, but I'm talking about remember what came before it and remember what came after it, and then look at Abraham, right? And so with Moses, remember where he ends up. Remember where he's come from. And when you do that, you put his whole life together. You're like, wow, I'm seeing things I've never seen before. Kim, I saw your hand. I was just, just going to say that, you know, um, Pharaoh, he thought he was God. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he felt like he was the God. And so Moses was challenging him. God was challenging Yes, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, I meant to bring that up, but I rabbit trail. Um, so I, I, I'm, you're right. He, he was, there was this challenge between Pharaoh and God himself, right? So like I said, Moses and Pharaoh, there's this test of wills between the two. And it's a question of who's going to last longer, right? On the other hand, it's God and Pharaoh, right? It's not just Moses, Whereas God is sending these plagues, you know, Moses is just an instrument. He's the, vis he's the visual, the visible leader. He's the, the messenger from God. But at the end of the day, it's Pharaoh who has all this power and all this authority. He's like God himself. He thinks he's God himself. But God is showing Pharaoh every single time with the plagues, I'm God. You're not God. And so, and so as God's reputation, just like Moses, increases, Pharaoh's reputation goes down, right? And each plague correlated to pieces that the Egyptians typically had gods for, right? And with each plague, whether it's the Nile River, the gnats, the flies, and probably one of the biggest gods in Egypt was the sun, Blacking out the sun. Each, and that's the whole polytheism where you think there's a God for each thing. And God himself is showing there's not a God for each thing. I'm God for every thing. And that final plague was an, a direct attack upon Pharaoh himself. Right? And if you, just, if you just read through the plagues, you might not think about that. Right? And, and I'll, t I'll say, there are some things that I... Notice that I didn't notice before. Uh, one of the biggest ones I've noticed. Um, the fatherhood is a very big theme in the Exodus story. So at the very beginning, you have Moses, who was, um, he came into the situation where Pharaoh was killing the children. And Pharaoh is almost kind of like a father figure in this story, an evil father figure in the story where he's supposed to be protecting these children, but instead he wants to kill them. And there are four women in the story of Moses at the very beginning in chapter 1 and 2, or just chapter 1. No, chapter 2 also. Um, so the Hebrew midwives, they say, no, we're not going to kill the children. Moses' mother says, no, I'm not going to kill my child. And then finally she puts him in the Nile. Moses' sister watches, and then the Egyptian princess finds him. Four different characters. I know the midwives are multiple people, but four different female characters. And it's like, where was Moses' father? Is there a reason why God didn't put that down? I think so. Because at the end of the day, who was the father figure for Moses at the end? God himself. And, and at the beginning, what you have is, I can't help but think that some of these plagues were like punishments upon Egypt. You know, God tends to punish us in ways very similar to our crimes, right? Egypt wanted to kill the boys of the Hebrews. At the end, God killed the firstborns of the Egyptians. 
What Egypt was trying to do to the Hebrews, God did to the Egyptians. And whenever Pharaoh killed the boys of the Hebrews, it was the disobedient Hebrews who kept their boys alive. Hebrew midwives said, no, we're not going to obey this. Moses' Moses's mother said, no, I'm not going to do this. They disobeyed and they saved their children. And the Passover, whenever God was killing the firstborns, it was the obedient Hebrews who saved their children by putting the blood of a lamb on their lamppost. And so those small connections I never would have made if I hadn't put on a piece of paper the life of Moses and I went through it piece by piece and then at the end tried to connect all the different pieces. There's a balance to what God does a lot of the times. You can't tell me that that was accidental. You can't tell me that that was coincidental. There's no way, right? And so when we're looking at oh, the concept of fatherhood, so not only did Pharaoh try to kill the boys, at the end, God killed the Egyptian boys. And that was his way of saying, actually, I'm in control of the children. Right? And right after you have the plague, you have the Passover, where God says, I'm going to save your firstborn boy. And then right after, you have a chapter on the consecration of the firstborns. I think that's chapter 13. Where God says, you know those boys that I just saved? I want you to dedicate them to me. He says, when you have a firstborn, I want you to dedicate that boy to me. He says, I will let you take them back if you, if you sacrifice a lamb. It, it's like God saying, this is my child but I'll let you borrow him for a price, right? And, and that's foreshadowed in the sacrifice of Jesus, right? Whenever he saved us and he redeemed us for a price. So children are a major theme in Exodus, and God's power over those children, God's possession over those children is, God, is a big theme. How God saved the boys like Moses how God had the chance to take back the children, because any time a child dies, that's actually God just taking back the child. Where he says, I let you borrow him, but I'm taking him back. All children are just belong to God. But this is God saying, God letting everyone know, all the children belong to me. I'm just letting you borrow them. And so that's a big theme in Exodus, right? Um, I actually want to go ahead and open up our Bibles and look at a specific part one part that really appealed to me is Exodus chapter 4, the second half. I don't have it on the screen, so we're just going to open up our Bibles. That's good. We're only halfway there. No, not really. No, I, I don't want to go through a, uh, a, um, a Bible class without opening our Bible. I know I've been talking about Bible, but let's actually... I want to read a couple of pieces. Um, so in the story of Moses, there he has to go from the world he knows as a shepherd in Midian in the desert. He has to return to uh, Egypt to confront his failure and to do what he tried to do when he was 40 and to lead the Israelites and to save them from slavery. And that transition from the world he's in to back to his old world or the new world, you could look at it either way, to accomplish God's mission, there are certain steps he takes. So Exodus chapter 4, the first thing, starting in verse 18, the first thing he's going to do is he's going to tell his father-in-law and say, hey, I have to quit my job and I have to go. The next thing he's going to do is he's going to uh, have this little argument with his wife about starting to obey God. Then he's going to meet with Aaron, and then he's going to meet with the Israelites. These are four things that he does in order to get to the point where he can accomplish God's mission. Verse 18, then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, let me return to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, go, I wish you well. 
Now the Lord has said to Moses and Midian, go back to Egypt for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go. So I will kill your firstborn son. Like I said, big theme in Exodus is fatherhood. Verse 24. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. It's like, what? What happened here? Verse 25. But Zipporah, his wife, took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. Verse 27. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him to say and also about all the signs he had commanded him to perform. Verse 29. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before them and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshiped. So this is the kind of stuff that you would read in Exodus and you might almost skip over. So th this is between Moses getting called and Moses meeting Pharaoh for the first time. And not a lot happens. It, like I said, it's four short things that just kind of happen in a row. But whenever we're starting to ask about the person of Moses, his character, his life, the trajectory of his path, these are very important moments. This is him after receiving the call and realizing, okay, I got to do this because God's commanding me and he's not really letting me get out of it. And then you get to Pharaoh, where he's actually trying to accomplish it, but there's some things he has to do before he can do that. And what do these things have in common? So the first one, he says to his father-in-law, I got to go. And then the second one, he, he argues with his wife. His wife seems very upset that he has to circumcise his son. God was made Moses sick, and when they circumcised their son, God stopped making him sick. God left, God, God Gave up, God wasn't going to kill him anymore. So what do we take from that? God wanted Moses to circumcise his son. And I don't know the full details of what exactly going on, but what it seems to me is like his wife thought this was a very barbaric thing, where that she cut it off and she threw it at his feet. I think that's what she did whenever she touched his feet with it. She's like, this is disgusting. Why are you asking me to do this? And Moses over there, sick on his deathbed, is saying, listen, this is what God wants us to do. And so what that means is that up until now, Moses really wasn't obeying God because God wanted their children to be circumcised. And so there's this moment where Moses is trying to obey God, but his wife is trying to hold him back a little bit. The third time, Moses meets with Aaron. Aaron's the trusty sidekick. His, his fellow partner in crime, sometimes his mouthpiece. And then Moses and Aaron meet with the Israelites. Out of these four events, do you see a pattern? Do you see a similarity, a contrast? Out of these events, what do you see? Kim? Moses is being challenged. Being challenged. Being challenged to, you know, he's, he's left his... Hebrew faith behind, mm -hmm. and he's got to, he has to embrace it now, mm -hmm. especially if he's going to be God's, you know, God's messenger. Right. Yeah, so Moses seems to have left his Hebrew faith behind, and now he's being challenged in that he has to return to his faith. You know, in order to do the mission that God sent him to do, he's got to be faithful to God, right? Alex? I think there's also kind of like an order of importance to who he speaks to. Mm -hmm. He starts with his father-in-law, like the patriarch, the head of the whole family of the group, and then his wife, who should be his equal, and then his brother, who's going to work with him, and then he goes and talks to everyone else. Like he's hitting a, a hierarchy. That's a good. That's a good point. I like that. He's hitting a hierarchy. You know, the father-in-law who's over him, his wife who's equal with him, Aaron who's kind of his right-hand man, just a little bit below him, and the people beneath him. That's a really good point. 
Well, we're out of time. One thing that I noticed here is the import, uh, the significance of family. Each four of these are family, right? Uh, his father-in-law and his wife. It's interesting because it's almost like he's leaving his old family. His wife's coming with him, but there's a challenge there, right? He says to his father-in-law, not like he's leaving on bad terms, but he's saying, I have to leave you. And with his wife, he's picking God's will over his wife's will, right? And, and there's a little bit of a separation there saying, it's not what you want anymore. It's not what we want anymore. It's what God wants. And so there's a little bit of a challenge there. And then he goes to Aaron, his brother, who he hasn't seen in forever, and he's rejoining with them. And then he goes to his Hebrew people, who hasn't, he hasn't seen forever, and, and rejoining with them. And so it's almost like, I see this as a, a separation, adding what you both said, a separation from his old world and a joining with his other world, where he's separating from his father-in-law and his wife, kind of, and he's joining back with the Hebrew people that he has to now meet with. Not saying that he's just getting rid of his family. No, he still maintains those relationships, and he still is married to his wife. But this is him putting his old life behind him. And then you would ask yourself, how do I fit into this? What are the steps I have to take in order to put into action God's mission, right? Because Moses didn't just go from calling to doing it. He had a couple of steps he had to take, and that's what we have to do. We have to shed our old life to take on this new life that God has given us to accomplish his mission. And so whenever you start looking at things like this and start asking, okay, what's Moses going through right here? Some of these are a little bit more difficult. Some of them are a little bit easier. And then you reflect back upon yourself. And that's kind of what my paper was on. And that's what I wanted to talk to you guys about this morning. All right, I'm done. I hope you guys are having a good morning.